the Biedermans of 141st Street. We're at the exciting conclusion, almost. Okay, um, 20, chapter 23, but 24, um, remember they all got to um, open their Christmas presents, and Oliver did such a nice thing. Do you remember how he... Uh, at first, he went and looked at all the presents, uh, the packages that his sisters and everybody had gotten him and his presents, he realized were just yuck. And so then he did uh, envelopes and really thought about what they would like and um, gave them what they would like, um, helping his mother, looking at buttons with one of his sisters, not um, criticizing the cooking of the twins. And then, um, remember the dog uh, pulled um, Hyacinth up the stairs and at the very end uh, there was this note from Mr. Biederman, please come visit me. I want you to know something. And bring the kitten too, because remember he'd left the kitten, or took the kitten down. Okay, 23. Hyacinth tucked the kitten against her chest and sprinted inside with France close behind. Down the stairs she tumbled, seeking out each of her siblings and whispering, Family meeting, now! Maybe it was the crazed look in Hyacinth's eyes, or the fact that she was cradling a strange yet adorable kitten in her arms, but her siblings did not stop to argue. We're going to change out of our pajamas, Isa called down to her preoccupied parents as her siblings made a hasty exit up the stairs. What about breakfast? Papa called from behind the refrigerator door. No one responded. Hyacinth led her siblings out the first floor exit into the main hallway of the brownstone where the stairs rose to the other two apartments. Look what I found attached the, to the kitten I gave to the Biederman, Hyacinth said. She handed Oliver the card. You gave the Biederman this kitten? Why on earth would you do that? Asked Jessie, her eyes wide. Shush! Isa said to Jessie. Then she ordered Oliver to read the card. Oliver read it out loud, then started pacing back and forth. Oh man, oh man! What do you think he wants? Before anyone could answer, Isa caught sight of Lainey. The littlest Van Beeker had taken it upon herself to go up the stairs, and she was already halfway between the second and third floors. Lainey! They called, stumbling upstairs after her, but it was too late. She was pounding cheerfully on the door and calling out, Mr. Biederman! We're here! We have your kitten! By the time the other kids caught up with her, the locks were already disengaging. The door opened, and the Biederman looked down at them. Hyacinth's first thought was that he didn't look half as werewolfish as he had when she dropped off the placemat. Her second thought was, I feel brave. Come in. The beaterman stepped back and gestured inside. He wore black, but his hair was combed neatly, and he had shaved his beard. For a moment, no one moved. Then the kitten executed a graceful leap out of Hyacinth's arms and trotted inside, the tip of her tail flicking behind her. Please, the beaterman said, please come in. Hyacinth stood up straight, channeling Hyacinth the Brave, and stepped inside with France at her heels. Oliver followed his new blue knit hat with the fluorescent yellow tip trailing down his back. Lainey entered next, followed by Jesse and Isa. Violin music was playing softly from a stereo in the corner. Isa's eyes widened when she realized it was the CD she had made for him with her own playing. The apartment was sparse. There was a dining room table for one with a chair tucked into it, a worn sofa, a crooked side table, and two standing floor lamps. The Christmas tree Lainey had picked out was displayed in the middle of the table right in front of the placement Hyacinth had made. Lainey's picture of the brownstone was taped to the wall next to Hyacinth's wreath. The science project Jessie had made was resting on the side table next to the sofa where Oliver's letter and his haiku lay on the armrest. It was all there. But what the kids noticed more than the gifts they had given him 
were the many, many paintings, large and small, all black and white, and on every available wall space. The paintings showed a girl of different ages, from newborn to teenager, sometimes alone on the canvas and other times with a woman that looked her mom's age, her, their mom's age. Other canvases depicted just the woman. Some paintings were stark, as if the brush had crashed and torn against the canvas, while other paintings were tender, as if they had been painted over the course of hundreds of hours with the tip of the tiniest brush. The kids settled their eyes back on the beaterman. He had not moved from his position by the door, and the black kitten was winding itself around his ankles and mewing. The beaterman, with, his, with the force of the kid's stares on him, cleared his throat. I'm Mr. Beaterman, he said, somewhat unnecessarily, his voice rough. The kids looked back at him uneasily. I'm sorry for... The beaterman coughed, then paused and waved one hand. Everything. None of the kids said anything. The beatermans looked at Isa, then away again. Then he looked back at her. I'm sorry about last night, about not renewing your lease. It's just that Mr. Biederman stuttered to a stop. It's okay, Mr. Biederman, said Isa. We know we're sorry about your family. Mr. Biederman swallowed. A few months ago, he said to Isa, you played Luciana's favorite song outside on the brownstone steps. It was too much for me. I thought it would be easier, he trailed off, not finishing the sentence. They stood there in silence. The only sound was the brownstone floors creaking when the kids shifted. Then Hyacinth spoke up. Did you make all those paintings? He nodded. You must miss them so much. Mr. Biederman looked at her. I miss them every second of every day. Isa felt her heart pounding in her chest. Mr. Biederman, she said, we would like to be your friends. That is, if it's not too hard to be with us. Lainey walked over to her neighbor and without hesitation, she hugged him as only a four year old, a four and three quarters year old can hug. Let's be friends, she said, her voice muffled against him. Mr. Biederman looked down at her in surprise, his face filled with both despair and longing. When Lainey detached herself, he kneeled down. He didn't respond, but he reached for her hand. Mr. Biederman glanced up at Oliver. I'm sorry, Oliver said, stepping forward for the awful note. Mr. Biederman nodded. I deserved it and more. Hyacinth took Mr. Biederman's hand and pulled him up. Come on, it's time for Christmas breakfast. Oh no, I can't go, said Mr. Biederman as he resisted Hyacinth. I can't leave this apartment. You left to bring the kitten with the note down, said Jessie matter-of-factly. That was the one and only time, he replied. Not the only time, said Isa, helping Hyacinth lead him out the door. The first of many. Mama and Papa were waiting at the bottom of the apartment stairs by the kitchen when the kids came back to the apartment. What on earth were you doing up there for so long? Mama cried as the kids descended the staircase. And how come you're still in your pajamas? We can explain, said Jessie, but Mama was on a roll. The Castlemans have been here for 10 minutes. Even Auntie Harrigan and Uncle Arthur are awake. Isa appeared, leading a hesitant Mr. Biederman down the stairs. Mama, we'd like to introduce you to Mr. Biederman. Mama and Papa gaped as Mr. Biederman emerged from behind the children. He maneuvered around the moving boxes stacked along the banister. I'm so sorry to intrude, he said in a voice so quiet they all strained to hear him. I was manhandled. Papa recovered first. No, no, he said weakly. Please come in. Um, Merry Christmas. He gestured vaguely to the Castlemans. Do you know the Castlemans? Hello, Mr. Biederman said. Hello, they echoed back. Isa looked at her mother. Mama, can we get Mr. Biederman something to eat? Oh, yes. Mama came out of her trance and bustled around, grabbing many bread items and placing them on, the pla on a plate in an overflowing heap. 
He, she pushed it into Mr. Biederman's arms, then asked, Coffee? Tea? Milk? Juice? Flat water? Sparkling? Hyacinth slipped in. Mama, we'll get him a drink. You help the Castlemans. The Castlemans were now in hushed conversation with Auntie Harrigan and did not look as if they needed assistance, but Mama raced over to them. Can I get you something to drink, Mr. Biederman? Hyacinth asked, her siblings hovering around Mr. Biederman protectively. Water, please, Mr. Biederman said faintly. She disappeared into the kitchen and returned with a glass of water. He took a sip, then looked at the Vanderbeeker kids. Even after I've been so terrible to you, you still want to live in the same building as me? The Vanderbeeker kids did not even dare to breathe as they nodded. Mr. Biederman swallowed. I would like you to stay living here in the brownstone, he said, and then added hastily, if you would still like to. There was a brief pause, then joy burst forth and rang throughout the brownstone. Laney and Hyacinth jumped up and down and cheered, while Oliver pumped his arms in the air and shouted. Jesse and Isa threw their arms around each other. Mama and Papa hurried over. What on earth? exclaimed Mama. We can stay, we can stay, chanted Hyacinth. We don't have to move to Ottenville, yelled Oliver. I get to keep Mr. Van Hooten as a violin teacher, exclaimed Isa. Mama and Papa looked wide-eyed at Mr. Biederman. Please, I'd like you and your family to stay in the brownstone, Mr. Biederman said. There was stunned silence, and then, Oh, thank you, thank you, cried Mama, enveloping in a spontaneous him in a spontaneous hug. Oliver was afraid Mama would lift him off the ground with her enthusiasm. Okay, okay, said Papa, detaching Mama from Mr. Biederman's neck. Then he put out his hand and shook Mr. Biederman's. Thank you. This means so much to us. Will you visit me and play the violin? Mr. Biederman asked Isa. Yes, she replied. If it's not too hard for you, Mr. Van Hooten told me about the violin. Mr. Biederman nodded. It was nice to see you, to hear it. St it was nice to see it, to see, uh, to hear it sing again. He turned to Hyacinth. Will you teach me how to take care of a cat? Oh, yes, cried Hyacinth. I'll help too, said Laney. Laney, can you help me name it? Mr. Biederman asked. Fluffy, Laney said promptly, or cutie, or... Princess cutie. Let's think about it some more, suggested Mr. Biederman. At that moment, Miss Josie and Mr. Jeet entered the apartment, and the kids rushed over to share the news. We're staying! We're staying! cried Hyacinth. Laney grabbed Miss Josie around the waist. We can be together forever! Oliver saw Mr. Jeet smile so big, it looked like someone had told him he'd won a million dollars. Is it true? Miss Josie said, bracing herself on M Mrs. Vanderbeeker's arm. Yes. Have you met Mr. Biederman? asked Mama. She dragged Miss Josie and Mr. Jeet to Mr. Biederman and bustled off to get food for the new arrivals. The doorbell rang and in came Aggie and her dad to say goodbye, only to realize that goodbyes were no longer necessary. Mr. Smiley got on his phone to notify the neighbors, and soon enough, a crowd of happy friends arrived at the Vanderbeeker's doorstep to celebrate. When Allegra flew in, decked in a flowing red dress with wide black ribbon tied around her waist, the first thing she did was embrace Isa and explain, exclaim, Now we have to find a guy to take you to the eighth grade dance. Already done, Isa said, smiling at Benny. Shush up! Allegra. Allegra Allegra, looked like she had just been given an early birthday present. That is so, so awesome! I can't wait to take tell Carlson. Benny, you better get Isa a corsage. Listen, at the florist on Lenox Avenue, they have this carnation color called amaranth pink. It's the color you need to get because it will go best with the color of her dress and her hair. Don't forget... Amaranth pink. Oh, and you need to wear a suit, okay? No football jersey allowed. Benny looked down at his current outfit, a jersey and jeans. Then he looked at Isa in alarm. But Allegra wasn't done with Benny. Do you have a friend who can take Jesse? 
Never gonna happen, Jessie said, flicking the remains of her chocolate croissant at Allegra and hitting her right in the middle of her forehead. A crowd of neighbors, including Mr. Jones, the postman, and Mr. Ritchie, the Christmas tree guy, stopped in along with Mr. Van Hooten, who pulled out his violin and started playing holiday music. The Vanderbeeker home was filled to capacity, with neighbors and friends all swarming in, a, in to congratulate and celebrate. Mr. Vanderbeeker, in the meantime, spent most of his time sitting on a stool in a sheltered corner of the kitchen, a location that granted him a perfect view of all the happenings around him, but protected him from the crush of people. Next to him was Oliver, immersed in his new books. Mr. Biederman's cat, who Lainey had already started calling Princess Cutie, was wrapping herself around his ankles. Isa, Jesse, and their friends stood in a group, laughing about who knows what. France turned in circles, attempting to remove a piece of red fabric tied in a jaunty bow around his neck. Lainey crawled around the floor, traversing a path that made sense only to her. Uncle Arthur examined the hole in the ceiling that Papa had made during the great plumbing accident, shaking his head in disbelief. Mama and Papa stood in the kitchen washing dishes, filling glasses, and forcing more food onto their guests' plates. Mr. Biederman quietly surveyed the scene, and then he took a deep breath. Oliver, who had glanced over at just that moment, said later, it looked like Mr. Biederman was breathing happiness into his body. It was hours before the Vanderbeeker apartment cleared out. Mr. Biederman was one of the first to leave, but only after Lainey made him promise to come back the following day for dinner. She cradled his black kitten, no, he cradled his black kitten in his arms as he said a brief goodbye and escaped up to his apartment. The other guests trickled away on, until only Auntie Harrigan and Uncle Arthur were left. While Mama and Papa began cleaning up the apartment, the kids helped their aunt and uncle pack up, pack up. After innumerable hugs and kisses, Auntie Harrigan and Uncle Arthur got in their car and honked as they rolled down the street while the kids waved and shouted their goodbyes and I love yous. When the car rounded the corner and disappeared from sight, the Vanderbeekers turned and faced the brownstone. I guess we should help clean up and start unpacking, Jesse commented. Let's start now, Oliver suggested. I'm ready. Isa held up a hand. Let's just wait a second. The kids stilled and drank in the sight of the brownstone, the twisting iron fence that surrounded it, the smooth red rock that made up the facade, the wide windows that winked in the sunlight. When they'd had their fill, the Vanderbeekers filed inside the filed inside. The brownstone creaked as it settled more firmly into its foundation, wrapping the kids in warmth and love, just as it had for so many years past and would now for so many years to come. Dawn, dawn, dawn. Okay, there's a little bit more. It's called the epilogue.